things about, I have, I have to note the artist who did the cover on this book. Her name is Syra Wasim. Um, the Pakistan army was so upset with this cover that this cannot be used in Pakistan. So I'm not sure what the cover will be used in the OUP version in Pakistan. It'll probably be like I Heart Terrorist or something. But it, it won't be uh, <laughs> the work of uh, Syra Wasim. But I want to point her work out to you. Go check out her website because she let me use this image for free. And one of the things I've noticed um, about her artwork, a lot of her work speaks to civil military affairs in Pakistan. So I thought her work was really appropriate for this, for this book. So and you'll see kind of how this leads into the title of the talk, which is the sort of future of Indo-Pakistan relations. So I've been studying Pakistan since well, 1993 formally, informally since 1991. And what one can't help but notice is that Pakistan has largely used the same strategy since 1947. And you generally expect states to get rid of policies that don't work, and certainly you expect them to get rid of policies that are imperiling the state. Why do I say it's imperiling the state? So um, all of the, the militant organizations with which you are all very familiar that operate under Pakistan's nuclear umbrella, have certainly since two, late 2001, early 2002, have begun reorganizing, and now they, they terrorize the Pakistani state itself. So when Pakistanis say, how can we be supporters of terror when we're victims of terror, the only thing that you need to say is that there would be no TTP if there were no Jaish al Muhammad, right? So the strategy that, that Pakistan has developed, which is basically jihad under a nuclear umbrella, is actually endangering the very viability of the state. Yet, Pakistan not only continues to be revisionist in its claim about Kashmir, as I argue in the book, its revisionism has actually expanded beyond Kashmir. So even if there could be a border ferry that came down and fixed the border, you're still going to have a Pakistan problem. That what Pakistan articulates in its military publications and if it were just the military publications, but unfortunately it's also in Pakistan's textbooks, it's in Pakistan's media, so these messages are constantly reinforced throughout Pakistan's what I will call not so civil society, is this idea that Pakistan faces a civilizational adversary, which they have framed in religious terms. And of course this goes back to the two nation theory. So um, I'm hoping to write a book that sort of argues that at the core of Pakistan's problems is ironically the two-nation theory, right? Because as soon as you basically agree that citizenship is identified with religion, you open up the space for people to say, well, what's a real Muslim? And that's exactly what Pakistan faces today, right? It's not just enough to be a Sunni Muslim now, you have to be a Deobandi. And they're even going after Brailvis, which is pretty shocking because even the Afghan Taliban didn't go after the Naqshbandi shrines when they were in Afghanistan. So, I began this project trying to understand why is it that if we were just thinking about, if we just made up a game, right, like Dungeons and Dragons but called it India and Pakistan, and we set up rules, you would have expected Pakistan to have concluded that its strategies not only don't work, but that it's dangerous. And they should have come up with a new strategy. Yet Pakistan hasn't done that, and I really wanted to understand why. The conventional wisdom, and this is speaking from an American point of view, I don't necessarily think that this is what you guys think in these terms, but when Americans think about why Pakistan continues to obsess with India, the Americans tend to think it's because Pakistan is an inherently insecure state. Now this implies that it could be made secure. In other words, the assumption is that Pakistan is a security-seeking state, and this animates much of what the American government does when it interacts with Pakistan. It also gives rise to these really dangerous assumptions that by, tr by encouraging there to be some resolution on Kashmir, we get Pakistan that behaves better, will put down militant proxies, and will therefore also be less concerned about Afghanistan. So this gives rise to like arguments by um, Ahmed Rashid and Barnett Rubin that there should be some sort of um, a grand bargain in Kashmir. Um, I write in the book that this is a very thought, very flawed thinking because what becomes very apparent when you read Pakistan's defense writings is that their concerns about India are actually not about Kashmir, their concerns are about India. And I think that's a really important uh, thing to understand. I'm going to argue in the book, drawing from the work of a political scientist named Charlie Glazer, 
that Pakistan is actually an ideological state. And, and how does he define this? And I think his own words best describe Pakistan. Fundamentally dissatisfied with the status quo, desiring additional territory even when it's not required for security. So what's interesting about the Pakistani argument on Kashmir, they don't articulate it in security. They, they could make a water argument that would be a very reasonable and rational thing to do. We're concerned about the future security of our water supply. Not in any article over six decades did I ever encounter that argument. When they talk about Kashmir, it's always about the incomplete partition process. It's always about the two-nation theory. And of course, they can't let go of the two-nation theory because that's their claim to Kashmir. So it's a very literally vicious circle. The second point that Glazer makes, which I think describes Pakistan to a T, is that purely greedy states pursue revisionism to increase prestige, spread ideology, and or propagate their religious worldview. When I went through this exercise of reading their, their defense literature, I could find no other mission that they articulated vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir than this. The implications, I argue, is that when you look at the literature on greedy states, if you treat them as a security-seeking state, you actually encourage them to behave even more egregiously, right? And I think the evidence on that is pretty ample. What Pakistan has learned is that it gets rewarded for being dangerous. Um, what they, they've sort of made a living on saying that they're too dangerous to fail. And this is how Pakistan kind of perpetuates itself as a rentier state. So the data that I use, I said, six decades of their defense publications, um, any memoir that I could find, um, this has been a, an archival process that, that's just taken forever. And I also have a bunch of stuff on jihadi literature, that's my next project, and a bunch of uh, survey data and data on the uh, Pakistan Army, um, the Pakistan Army uh, recruitment data, which I'm going to show you at the very end, because that has, I think, a lot of implications for India. So the key findings of going through this, like, you know, as I say, Pakistan's revisionism, it's not primarily tied to security. I think none of this stuff would surprise you in this audience, but it is fairly surprising for Americans. And I'm always surprised that that's surprising. Um, and I think part of the problem is, if you think about how the American government assigns people to work on Pakistan, it's constantly going through new personnel. No one works on this portfolio for more than a few years. I mean, there's a, there's a handful of people that do. So by the time someone has figured out that Pakistan has been lying or misrepresenting, they're being shipped off to Peru or to Poland. And so then comes in this new ingenue, who again, this whole process of, of basically learning begins, and as soon as they figure a little bit out, they're shipped off to their next assignment. And I would argue that this is true across many of the billets. The only place where it's not true, by the way, is the Department of Defense. And if you were to go to the Pentagon today, the anger that you will find amongst US military personnel would probably surprise you. Because I think many Indians think that the US military is pro-Pakistan. But you have to remember that we've now been fighting this war in Afghanistan now for 13 years. And what everyone has learned is that when they've been fighting the Taliban, and the, and the Taliban are actually fighting pretty well, that's sometimes the SSG, right? The Pakistani SSG fighting with the Taliban. And so they're learning really fast that the Pakistanis take our money and then use that to kill us in Afghanistan. So you're not going to find any love for Pakistan anymore in the DOD. Those days are absolutely gone. Um, so some of the things I, that I took away, um, I think this audience knows this. So Pakistan, they say this repeatedly. You, it, every army chief says this, and it goes all the way down, is that they not only defend the territorial frontiers of Pakistan, but they also define the the ideological frontiers of Pakistan. What is an ideological frontier? Some people think that Zia began this. It didn't. Ayub Khan began it. So in 1954, he wrote an article on foreign affairs where he talks about the ideological frontiers of Pakistan. And he opens this essay with reference to Allama Iqbal and the two-nation theory. So this did not begin with Zia. This actually began with Ayub Khan. In his book, Friends Not Masters, he has a whole chapter on the, the ideology of Pakistan. So if we, if we think that this started with Zia, we underestimate the gravity and durability of the problem. This, this goes back uh, 
to the first Pakistan army chief. The other thing that comes across is this, this idea that if they let go of the two-nation theory, in other words, Pakistan just becomes a state for Muslims, then it's not a state worth residing over. So every army chief, and I, ha I don't think the current one has said it yet, but I'm sure he will, has said that the terms for peace with India is that they accept Pakistan as their equal. So that's kind of a preposterous demand because by no definition of equal is Pakistan equal to India. And that they accept the two nation theory, right? So these are very problematic demands. But this is how Pakistan sees itself def defending the ideology. When you read their publications, they articulate over and over and over that our job is to protect the Islamic nature of Pakistan, a very strange rule for the Pakistan army. If the Indian army were to make such statements in their professional publications, there would be riots, right? If, if the an American army published such nonsense, there would be outrage and riots. Yet this is quotidian fare in Pakistan army's uh, publications, pretty astonishing. The other thing that comes across very clearly when you read their stuff is that their idea of defeat is not defined in how many soldiers were killed, how much territory was lost, what the value of that real estate was strategically, how many POWs were captured, but rather that Pakistan is able to continue resisting India's rise. There are repeated formulations of this. So even after the 1971 war, where most sane people would say, well, Pakistan, you lost that. <laughs> Pakistanis will say, well, no, not quite. Because even though we were cut in half by a more powerful, well, XYZ army, we are still the only country in the region that can challenge India's hegemony. So um, the reason why I have the, the, the Black Knight there, for those of you who know Monty Python, <laughs> it is the Black Knight in the forest. He gets his arm cut off. It's just a flesh wound, because it's still a flesh wound. So in some sense, Pakistan doesn't quite recognize that it's now just a head bobbing in the forest because it's lost its arms and its legs. It doesn't realize this. So in some sense, it's like an insurgent, right? An insurgent doesn't have to defeat the counterinsurgent. It just has to ensure that it can continue to resist the counterinsurgent. In contrast, the counterinsurgent has to decisively defeat the insurgent to win. So it redefines victory in a way that says, as long as we can get ourselves up and continue fighting India, we have not been defeated. And a former army chief, I'm sure those of you who do track two know quite well, he explained this to me in 2000 after Cargill. He said that for us, defeat is to do nothing and is to acquiesce to India's rise. So we will always take a calculated risk, then do nothing, because to do nothing is actual defeat. And I, and I think that sort of, once he sort of laid that out to me, I understood immediately for them to do nothing is to basically say they have acquiesced to India's dominance in the region. And that would, that would have tremendous domestic implications for them, right? How could they then justify having a very large part of the budget? How could they justify nuclear weapons? How could they justify, most importantly, taking over the country on the claims that they are best prepared to manage the Indian threat, right? If they acquiesce to it, then this entire logic of the army preying upon the state sort of unwinds. So they're going back to the point, Indo, Pakistan, detente, there will never be any, is, is my view. So I'm, I argue in the book that Pakistan persists in this constant war footing, in part because of the way it redefines victory and defeat. The other thing that I, uh, I don't need to talk about this, but some of the foundations of Pakistan's strategic culture, how do they therefore not only prepare the army to continue thinking like this, but they also have to prepare their people to continue thinking like this, right? Because armies draw from the people that they represent. So my brothers in the US Army, they have to constantly beware of the recruiting environment. Is it favorable? Is it not favorable? When the people massively disagree with the mission of the military, recruitment goes down. So it's important that the army diffuse these messages outside of the barracks into the rest of civil society. And so one of the, so these are just very briefly um, some of the tropes. You cannot go to Pakistan without hearing the grousing about Kashmir. Now why is this? Most Pakistanis themselves do not have a real position on Kashmir. 
But Kashmir, for them, is really their remaining claim because of the two-nation theory. If they let go of Kashmir, the two-nation theory falls apart, right? Because they have no act so we can discuss the legality of their claims to Kashmir, and in fact, there are none, right? I mean, I, Shumik and Guli and I wrote a piece, like, we should stop entertaining this is a dispute because their, their claims have no legality. But if they let go of that, then they have pretty significant problems with the two-nation theory because it's been so dis decisively hammered. The other thing that I thought was kind of interesting is that a lot of the, their threat perceptions about Afghanistan, they actually inherited from the British. And we can talk about how it evolved, but as the Indian and, uh, and Russian relationship changed, their perception of that threat changed. Now, Afghanistan is mostly a place where Pakistan imagines the Indian threat. But this is, you have to understand how absolutely durable this is. You, you see them writing about strategic depth in Afghanistan from the earliest days of their, of their defense publications. Most importantly, I, I cannot emphasize to you enough how often this comes up, Islamic character in the two-nation theory. When Americans come across some of these publications about jihad in the Pakistan army, they freak out. And they'll say, oh, Pakistan's a jihadi army. They're not understanding how this imagery is functioning within the army. So if you read the green books, and I have almost all of them scanned, I think I'm missing one, um, cons persistent discussions about how Pakistan is an Islamic army. This has a couple of implications. In their narrative, India started every war. This, you'll never find an official publication of any war that Pakistan admits it started. So you obviously already have a huge disconsonance between reality and what they think. They do this because then they say that Pakistan's reaction was a defensive jihad. They actually define what Pakistan did as a defensive jihad. Um, you might notice they have Yome Pakistan in September, which is where they actually <laughs> celebrate that they didn't get completely defeated in Lahore. I mean, only in Pakistan do they get to manufacture. Well, that's not true. We have Thanksgiving, where we celebrate <laughs> the beginning of the genocide of the indigenous people. So I should say that holidays are, in fact, made up for exactly this purpose. They also talk about the importance of Islami tarbiyat. And tarbiyat is it. You guys, does anyone not know what tarbiyat is? Everyone knows, right? Because you guys use it in Hindi too. So for Amer, you don't. So oh, okay. In Pakistan, is it a universal idea? Okay. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what Pakistanis think about two-nation theory, and you'll see every Pakistani has to has to study what's called Iqbaliyat. Oh, well, okay, so this goes back to um, the, the early 20th century. Jinnah, he, and this is also coming from Allama Iqbal, says that Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations. Now, Pakistanis think that when this was articulated, it meant that this was an initial demand for Pakistan. That's not necessarily what Jinnah meant. What Jinnah was trying to do was to make a minoritarian political discourse that says, yes, we are fewer in number than Hindus, but we are a separate but equal nation. And he was trying to use that to leverage equal representation in a parliament post-decolonization. And of course, Congress said that's absolutely insane. Why should you have equal representation? Well, you're not equal numbers, right? So Congress basically said one person, one vote. And then um, Congress feared that they couldn't come to some sort of agreement that the British would defer the decision to decolonize. And so Congress said, go, go have your, go have your Pakistan, have fun with it. And so if you read Farzana Sheikh or even Aisha Jalal, there's this idea that Jinnah was himself so surprised that he got Pakistan because he had no plan to actually set it up, right? So the first thing that he had to do was set up the state of Pakistan from a very set of um, poorly staffed, uh, incohate structures. So when Pakistanis learned the two-nation theory, they learned that the moment it was articulated, it was a demand for Pakistan. They will talk about the objectives resolution um, of 1920 in Lahore, they, they actually celebrate the day that that resolution was passed as the Pakistan resolution. 
if you actually read the resolution, which no Pakistani has until I made them in my class, <laughs> there's no mention of the word Pakistan, there's no mention of the word partition, and they talk about Muslim states. So there's, we can so there's a lot of debate among scholars about what the two-nation theory is, but what the Pakistanis have done is that they've pared it down to a discourse that says, Hindus and Muslims are separate, we're immiscible, we can't live under their dominion, and in permanent civilizational state of conflict. So when the Pakistan army says, the two-nation theory is our ideology, what they're basically saying is, we are civilizationally incapable of coexisting with India. Now, this has really had enormous implications, right, for Pakistan in 1947, because 25% of its population were not Muslim. And that sort of set the, the scene for how it lost East Pakistan. And by the way, East Pakistan had much of the political history, the, the parliamentary experiences. You could do a thought experiment that had Pakistan, had its strategic center been in East Pakistan, you would have had a very different Pakistan, right? So that's a, I'm happy to talk more about that, but in essence, that's how Pakistanis see this. And so when the Pakistan army talks with the two nation theory, when, and they talk about defending the ideological borders of Pakistan, that's what they're talking about. It's a very strange argument for an army to make. Can you imagine if the Indian army laid out some sort of ideological frontier of India? I mean, it would, it would be very provocative. Um, if the Americans were to do this, I mean, we're a fairly ideological army too, but to frame it in religious terms is actually pretty unusual. Um, and to write about it in professional journals is really quite insane. Why do I say this? Because there are Emadis in Pakistan's military. There are Sikhs. There are Christians. Um, the Emadis, of course, really lay low. That the army would, as a corporation, espouse an ideology that is so deeply othering to members of its own, of its own force is really quite strange. But when I talk to Shias, they're okay with this, even though there's this larger political discourse in Pakistan that says they're not Muslim enough. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's the irony. When you, set, when you define a state on religious terms, you open up the space for people to say, who's Muslim enough? Whose religious interpretation is the correct interpretation? They'll all say there is only one Islam, but they'll say that one version of Islam is my Islam and the rest of you are Kufar. So this is a very pernicious discourse on Pakistan that the army directly contributes to. So you never want to be in this position of saying that just because everything was this way, it will remain, right? Pakistan is civilizationally opposed to India. It has been, therefore it will be. So I went through these, what are the different kinds of shocks that could happen to Pakistan where the army would begin to rethink the way in which it does business. And by the way, I reduce this to the army because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs might be well-meaning, but it doesn't control any of the levers of policy that I care about, right? Which is relations with the United States, India, Afghanistan, uh, when to go to war and under what circumstances, or the nuclear weapons portfolio. All the things I care about are controlled by the army, not the prime minister, not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I went through these different things, and I, mean, I can't even say some of them without laughing. So a major confrontation with the U.S. So this is where people talk about L.E.T. blows up something in New York. I say, well, hold on. Osama bin Laden was caught an easy stroll from the Pakistan Military Academy, and we still write the check. I mean, what, what more major confrontation could you imagine than Osama bin Laden being caught near the PMA? What more major confrontation can you imagine than we've given them $30 billion? Think about $30 billion. And most of our deaths in Afghanistan are due to the Taliban, not Al-Qaeda. So I, I don't know what they would possibly do before the Americans would view them as a security threat, as they should, and, and deal with them appropriately. Natural disasters. Actually, the Pakistan army always comes out on top. The 2010 flood was incredible. The Pakistan army came out smelling like a rose. And in fact, in fairness, Pakistan handled that flood pretty well. Other people talk about what about international coalitions? I, I can't even say that without laughing because there is no consensus on the Pakistan problem, right? So some of America's allies, like the Saudis, see Pakistan very differently. Um, the, 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 the British, for example, 
they don't want to push down, they don't want to uh, be too difficult with the Pakistanis because what they want is the ISI to follow their citizens when they go to jihadi training camps. <laughs> so all of our different allies that should be allies, we look at Pakistan through a very different lens and we're trying to, you know, it's like we're all trying to get something different out of that Pakistan, which means that we're never going to agree on really how best to handle it because each of us have very specific and unique problems. Solutions to one of those problems actually exacerbates the other problems for the other allies. Like you understand this very clearly, right? What we do to manage our Pakistan threat is exactly things that harm your interests. And so you can go through these different dyads and there's probably six countries that matter in the Pakistan problem. Anything, so it's like a water balloon. You squeeze on it in one place and the water just goes out someplace else. So it's very hard to make everyone happy with the Pakistan problem at the same time. Um, and similarly, there's people talk about, well, there's interesting changes happening within Pakistan. And I'm also a pessimist about that. So everyone talks now these days about the democratic transition and how the army can't even think about a coup. I'm not so sure that's true. As long as the army can control what it needs to control, it doesn't need to have a coup. And, right, and armies don't like having coups because it takes them out of their main footing, which is war fighting. Um, and so during long periods of military governance in Pakistan, you also get people that are being passed over for promotion, all of this trickles down, and the longer the army chief stays as the president, you have two cohorts of PMA passing out every year, so the distance between him and his senior most general continues to expand. And so this means that his relationship with his army, with his force, begins to break down and he begins to rely upon other intermediaries. So this is, no one truly would prefer a coup. They only do it when they absolutely have to. And right now, they don't have to do it. I would argue that if Musharraf was actually, you know, walking up and the punsi was being, there might be a coup. Um, what they absolutely don't want with this government is for Musharraf to go to the gallows. But anything short of that, there's, why should they have a coup? They're, getting they're having their cake and they're eating it too. Everyone talks about civil society, and I know some of you do track two. Um, I hate to be the, the mean lady, but the most effective civil society in Pakistan is actually not civil, right? So Jamaat al Dawa is a very effective civil society organization. It's just not civil. The ones that are liberal um, in the, the sorts of organizations that want to work with India or, for that matter, even Israel, believe it or not, these are organizations that are very small, they are very elite, they have no, they have, they do not aggregate interests in a larger way. The ones that aggregate interests are the groups that are very dangerous, right? So Hizbul Tahir, Jamaat al Dawa, the sectarian groups are civil society. Believe it or not, they are. So um, when I do survey work, I actually find Pakistani youth to be more menacing than their parents. Um, so just think about all of those youthias, as they're called, by their enemies. Did you, you guys don't know that word, the youthias? It rhymes with another word, but it's just made with youth. <laughs> Spell it. Don't make me explain it, because you all are a very Sharif audience, and I don't want to use that word. Um, so yeah, that's what they're called. They're derisively known as the youthias by the, uh, the, the part of civil society that we wish were more effective. Um, the people rallying around Imran Khan, Imran Khan is basically Taliban Khan, right? I mean, he ran, he ran on a platform of peace with the TTP, an organization that says, we don't want your constitution, we want democracy. We, all of this is gone. And he ran on a platform of peace with these clowns. Um, he also supports the Afghan Taliban. And, and he himself brought into his, his circle Jamaat Wallahs, right? So the understanding, certainly in the United States, and I don't think Indians had any, had any such truck with this, with this silliness, that Imran Khan was like a Barack Obama. I'm like, yeah, if Barack Obama was a Klansman, you know? So uh, when I've interacted with that particular cohort of, of young persons, um, when I was an election observer, when I was teaching at LUMS, these are not young people that are looking at South Asia as a region of peace. They're looking at South Asia as a conflict sphere where Islam is under threat by neighbors near and far. And they're looking to explicitly Islamist political leaders to get them out of this mess. So I don't see a lot of hope there. Economic shocks will never happen 
because they're too dangerous to fail, right? There will always be an IMF payout. So if you want to change the way Pakistan does business, you have to take them off the welfare. But the Americans will be the first to say we can't do that because Pakistan is too dangerous to fail. You cannot convince the Pakistanis, you cannot convince the Americans that the Pakistanis won't fail. And I'm convinced they won't fail. It's the most stable instability. But too dangerous to fail, so the checks keep coming. But let me show you what is really interesting that has a, a lot to do with the kinds of discussions that you guys are interested in. So I, I do a lot of work with data. What you see here, this map, is actually district level Pakistan Army recruitment data. This is from 1972. And where the colors are darkest, this is the districts that are producing the officers. And what you see, the gray is that the vast majority of the country is not producing officers. And then I sort of take different snapshots as we move across time. 72, 82, 92, 2002, 2005. And this is where my data end. I'm not ever getting more of these data. So this is all I got. And what you can see is actually most of the districts now are producing officers. And what you see, of course, this is coming from um, Punjab, parts of KPK. By the time you get here, you're even reaching into districts in Balochistan, and then a lot of growth in sin, and then especially around here. All right, so what, is, what does this practically mean? OK, so it means the Army is getting more people from these far-flung districts. So it turns out I had data. So I don't expect you to read this. I'll walk you through. And by the way, all of this is on my website. It's also in the book. But um, on my website, it's christinefair.net in an article that was published in Security Studies. So I did a survey, and, and I basically picked a few questions because I wanted to see how much variation there is in these new districts about key questions about jihad, for example. So the first one is, some people say jihad is a personal struggle for righteousness. Others say jihad is protecting the Muslim ummah through war. What do you think? Jihad is solely a personal struggle. Jihad is both a personal struggle. Jihad is solely protecting Muslims. So that was one question that I looked at. So this gives us different ideas about who thinks what about jihad and where. The next one is, how much do you think Pakistan is governed according to Sharia? In the Urdu, it's Sharia. Um, seeing the current situation, do you think Sharia should play a larger role, blah, 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 a much smaller role? So here we're asking people, what do they think about the governance of Pakistan? By the way, this is a very foundational debate. Pakistanis disagree whether it should be a Sharia state. And by the way, they disagree about what Sharia is because there are five interpretive traditions in Pakistan. So as soon as you talk about Sharia, the Islamists start fighting. Oh, no, my Sharia. Oh, no, my Sharia. And then eventually they can't settle it and the whole discussion goes away, which is probably not a bad outcome. Um, then 73 Constitution says Pakistan's uh, civilians should control the military. So we're asking about civil military relations. And then finally, the political preferences of Muslims in occupied Kashmir, because that's what they call it. They call it Makbuza Kashmir. There's no use calling it anything else. That's what they call it. Tell us which statement you agree with the most. In occupied Kashmir, the majority of Muslims want to be a part of India, et cetera. So you get the idea. So that, these are, we're, we're basically trying to get a sense of what do they think about jihad, civil military relations, the role of Islam in government, and also what they think Muslims in Kashmir want. And so what's actually interesting, and I can walk you through this, every, when, when we first started this, everyone thought that ethnicity drove those beliefs. So if you were a Punjabi, whether you lived in Lahore or whether you lived in Quetta, you had opinions driven by your Punjabiness. I thought that was utter bugvas. I was like, who, who would think this? I'm from, I'm from Indiana, but I'm a flaming Democrat and an atheist, right? So by that logic, I should be, you know, a Jesus Stani Parast, and I'm clearly not. So, you know, I, what I find amazing about Americans, they never think about how similar Pakistanis are to this thing called humans. <laughs> and a lot of problems could just be solved where they just like, gee, if I were a Pakistani, i.e. a human, what would I think? So I had to actually go through and show people that no, this is not the case. So what's actually interesting is that Punjabis in the Punjab and Punjabis outside of the Punjab think very, very differently. When you ask them, jihad is a personal struggle for righteousness, i.e. don't kill people, 47% of Punjabis outside of the Punjab agree with that statement compared to only 15% in the Punjab. And by the way, this is a this, this 
survey had 14,000 people. So these differences are real, they're robust, they're not magical. Jihad is a militarized struggle. 28% of Punjabis in the Punjab thought that, compared to 12% outside. And going through each of these different questions, they're incredibly different. So in the Punjab, Punjabis want Sharia to play a much larger role, 49% compared to 15% of Punjabis outside of the Punjab. Uh, so in other words, ethnicity doesn't shape what people are thinking. It's also shaped by where they're living. By the way, that should make sense to everyone except the reviewers and to Americans, actually, uh, the, who paid for the survey, i.e. the State Department. <laughs> So then I looked at Punjabis versus non-Punjabis in the Punjab. And guess what? They're more similar. So in other words, there's something about being in the Punjab that affects what you think. Now this also makes sense, right? Because their, their, their textbooks are coming from the Punjabi textbook board. So they're being subjected to, for the most part, the same sort of socialization in the educational system. Um, they're reading the same editions of the newspapers if they're reading. Uh, so it makes sense that Punjabis and non-Punjabis in the Punjab think alike more so than not. There was one really important difference. So in all of these things, there's no statistical difference, um, or there are statistical differences that are pointless, like 41 versus 40 percent. With 14,000 people, that difference would be statistically significant, but it's just not huge. But this is really significant and it's large. Um, Punjabis in the Punjab, 41% of them thought that their government is uh, run completely by elected representatives. Non-Punjabis, only 26%. So something about Punjabis is uh, they're obviously living in a delusion. <laughs> that almost one two of them thought that they were living in an actual democracy. And I think that probably has a lot to do with the fact that there are six cores in the Punjab. So they have a very different stake in the state than perhaps non-Punjabis, but I have no real explanation for that. But let me show you some other interesting places. This is also true in the Sindh. So Punjabis in the Sindh, 54% of them thought that jihad is a personal struggle for righteousness. Remember what that number was in the Punjab? It was only 12%. So just by virtue of taking Punjabis out of the Punjab and throwing them somewhere else, they're thinking really differently. So why am I going through this whole exercise? When you look at those recruitment maps that I showed you, it's entirely possible that just because they're recruiting from Balochistan doesn't mean they're recruiting Baloch. Right? They could be recruiting Punjabis from Quetta. But it really doesn't matter because just by virtue of not being a Punjabi in the Punjab, they are getting people who think really differently and don't share these core strategic values of the Punjab that we so much associate. By the way, those maps that I showed you, I also have on my website um, maps of Lashkari Taiba recruitment. And they're recruiting from the same districts as the Pakistan Army. Uh, and there's, the reason is they're competing for the same pool of human capital, right? Both institutions actually are recruiting the same kind of person. Uh, I don't think there's anything conspiratorial. Um, and then, of course, the Punjab, uh, a lot, there's part of the militant groups are so affected there because of partition and, like for example, Gujarat is a hugely productive place in terms of producing soldiers, but also Lashkar Taiba. And so I go through all of these other places. Baloch, it's the same thing. Yeah, so it's entirely possible that over time, one of the free riders of Pakistan's efforts to diversify its ranks is that it's bringing in people who don't share these core jihadi values. All right, now, am I just, I'm, I'm not a fool. I do work with militaries for a living. My brothers are military recruiters. What do militaries do? They take all of the, the ojari <laughs> and the ghosh and they make a sausage, right? So by bringing in these people who have these different values, it's entirely possible that if they don't sort of get with the program, they don't get promoted, right? So we have no, we have no visibility into what happens to these people. We only know that they're recruiting from places that clearly hold very different values. So I don't, I'm not going to leave you with this idea that everything is going to become dory. But this to me is actually, let's just, let's also just say that, so the army, so let's just, let's take for the sake of argument the army does a good job 
and making a better sausage. In other words, taking these people that don't share this pro-jihad nonsense and making them, uh, either kicking them out or convincing them. You still, though, have the situation that their families, that they're being recruited from, don't share these values. And that's where militaries have problems sustaining what they do, when there's a disconnect between what they do, right, and what people think they do. I mean, this was my brothers were military recruiters with the Iraq War. They had a tremendous problem getting young men to join the military, because we also sign them up when they're 16. It requires parental permission. So when my brother would go to Mrs. Smith, please sign so that your son can join the US Army, Mrs. Smith would say, go to hell, get out of my house. And, and by the time he was old enough to join on his own, he had a job and was doing something else that didn't involve getting shot at in Iraq. So if the Pakistan army sausage that are producing is so different from the taste of the families that are producing it, this becomes difficult to sustain. So I don't, I'm not Panglossian, but this I think is the only hope for that country is that in their efforts to be more inclusive, and by the way, why does the army have to be inclusive? Because they run the country. Right? So the, the disquiet with armies running the country is that not everyone gets to share in the spoils of looting the country. So that's part of the reason why they're trying to be more inclusive. But the downside of being more inclusive is that they're getting people who don't share these values. So that for me is the only hope for the Pakistan army. And I will say it's a very slim hope. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Did you manage to ask them that given the choice between joining the army or this non-army or the civil society, or what you call it is not a civil society, what would they choose? Okay, so um, to clarify what my data are, my data, so I have two data, two kinds of data. One is officer recruitment data. So we know how many numbers were produced by the district, right? That's production data. The other data I have is survey data. So I never, so for you to have, to, to be able to do a survey where you could have enough numbers of actually asking people, I would have to, I would have to have a, I'd have to have all the IDs of people in the military and go and interview them. The Pakistan military doesn't do this. I don't think the Indian military does. Our military does. I mean, I've done a lot of work with survey data from our soldiers because we want to know what they think and why. Because we're, we're constantly trying to think about, are we going to have a shortfall or not? Um, as we change our IT requirements, are we going to have difficulty meeting those? So we're constantly surveying potential as well as current persons in uniform. So we don't have that opportunity in Pakistan. So I can't answer that question. But what I can tell you is that when I look at, um, I have this other project where we built a database of 1,800 militants based upon their so-called Shahid biographies. We do see some families will have someone in the military, and they'll also have someone in, say, Lushkar Taiba. Um, and uh, by the way, you know, so from our point of view, we can laugh at that and think, what the hell? But from their point of view, and I've done so much survey work on this, they think that what LET does is justified, right? They don't think that what LET does is not justified. So from their point of view, this is a just mission. Right? So, and not only that, is in both institutions you could become Shaheed, right? Um, and of course, Lashkar Taiba doesn't do suicide bombing, so it's a, it's a, they're, they're basically doing high risk missions, right? So, it, so it, it makes sense um, that they would be coming from the same family because they don't see the moral issue that you and I might have. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, I mean, I didn't mention this just because of, you know, time. Um, when you read the Pakistan Army journals, they also talk about the Ghazi spirit that, that is invested in the, in the Jawan and also in the officers. And so if you're thinking about managing the rhetoric of jihad, when both the army and the militant organizations are using the same rhetoric, it's how do you manage that? So you can, so I, I think about this like in the U.S. case, when my brothers are trying to recruit a woman or a man, his competition is 
is the Army Reserve, right, where you could go uh, play soldier for two days a week and then go training and maybe get called up. Full-time Army, Army Guard. If you want to do infantry, you also have Marine Reserves uh, as well as full-time Marines. So in some sense, they're competing for the same people because both the Army and the Jihadis, particularly Lashkar Taiba, they want the same guy. <laughs> anyway. That's I have a, a question for you. Yeah. I'm actually... Uh, not at all convinced when you say that Pakistanis seem to think alike about the two-nation theory because from my experience of having interacted with several Pakistanis on trips there and even otherwise... Say, uh, explain, th this is sample bias 101, okay. explain the capacity in which you went. Sorry? Ex explain the capacity in which you went. Okay, the and the organization that facilitated it. The first time I went was with the Citizens Archive of Pakistan. Okay, uh, and what is that? To interact with students and teachers. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the second and third time were for uh, children's literature festivals. Mm -hmm. And um, I did actually have many personal interactions which were, where people said that they actually would like to go to India to meet their divided family mm -hmm. or to study and they don't really... Uh, buy into what they've been taught in their textbooks and loads and loads of people. Okay, so, so I'm going to stop you right there because this is Social Science 101 and my first job is that I'm a professor. Okay. Um, you and I face the same thing and this is called social desirability bias. Mm -hmm. The people that hate you, right, are never going to talk to you, right? The people that, and I encounter this all the time, and what I really love is that they don't know I know Urdu. So one of my favorite things to do is just sit around in an environment and just listen. And then they see the American come in, and I hear all the nonsense. And I don't let them know. I just let them go on at their coffee bean and whatever the hell, and just blather on. And then after 45 minutes, I'll say, oh, gee, I've seen Mokabari Kushi Hui. So Shaitam is Mozupe, is he a best car? And they're like, holy crap. So... Um, then they realize it, you know, mm -hmm. and then they say, well, you know, not all Americans are bad. I said, well, no, I, I overheard what you were saying. You know, I, no, I, pre you were pretty clear what you meant. So mm -hmm. we have to be very careful that when we interact with people that we take those interactions as fact. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about these things, I'm not talking about my personal interactions with them. I'm drawing from my survey data mm -hmm. where my survey data is collected by Pakistanis in a scientific sample. It, what you have experienced, I've seen it. You know, so basically, you go to these folks. They've already pre-selected the terrain. I call them the kumbaya parast, right? They're receptive to your message, otherwise you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't have had a visa, right? If they, if, and by the way, the ISI is very invested in letting people like you come over because it says to the Americans, oh, look, we're letting all these peacemongers in. Right, so you have to be very, so what happened to you is what happened to every single American policymaker that ever met Kiani, right? Cult, so cultivating your contacts, cultivating your message, and no one would ever tell you what you didn't want to hear. So I, I, I know those people in Pakistan, they're lovely people, I love having scotch with them, but um, they don't represent Pakistan. And, and you also have to remember that when you meet very young children, young children, I have a niece, children want to satisfy and please elders, right? A child doesn't, a five-year-old doesn't want to say, I think you're the dumbest thing on earth and I, that shawl wear kameez you're wearing is totally hideous. Um, children want to please people that they interact with. And so you, I, people that do this track two stuff, you guys are really in the same boat as every American bureaucrat that's interacted with the state. They know how to tell you what you want to hear. Your job is to learn the Urdu script, and as you're having those meetings, go out and look at the, the anti-India, anti-Hindu nonsense that's written on the walls. Your job is to learn that script so that when you see all these wheat pacing campaigns, you know what they're saying. And when you have that, because you know Hindi, learn the script, it's easy. If I can learn it, you can learn it you'll see very quickly, like when I, would do, when I was doing my madrasa field work, I never let them know that I knew Urdu. I let them lie for hours. They took me around the madrasa and they said, oh, you know, these are, these are they're studying 10th grade Qaeda. In fact, they were studying the second grade Qaeda. So I, let, I just took note of all of the lies. And then when I met the Nazim, I said, well, this has all been a very interesting day, but let me tell you what I observed. You said there were no political activities here, but yet all over there were postings for rallies. So for you, I think, to get the most out of those things, these are the kinds of things that you really have to do and, and constantly push them because often it's a veneer, right? And I'll, okay, I'm a, I'll also be very blunt with you. Y'all get free trips. 
right? Who, everyone friggin' loves the track two boondoggles. Who doesn't love going to Colombo, to Colombo or to Dubai on a shopping spree or to uh, Kathmandu, any place where Pakistanis and Indians can get visas. So how do you keep getting back on the track two boondoggle? I don't ever get invited to track two boondoggles, ever, right? So this is also a self-licking ice cream cone that if you don't, drink the Kool-Aid, you don't get invited back. So if they tell you, oh, this two nation theory is just horrible, they might not get invited to the next boondoggle in Kathmandu. You're being brought to Pakistan on this occasion, but the next boondoggle may be in Colombo, right? So you always, always, always have to think, put your social scientist hat on and ask, what are the incentives for people to tell me what I want to hear? And are they telling me something that's legitimate and representative? And do I see signs that are countervailing? And when you do those things, you, you, you see a very different terrain than what they want you to see. By the way, I do this when I go out, when the Pakistan army, when I could still go, they took me to South Waziristan, lied through their teeth, um, lied, I, lied, ridiculous lies. And at the end, I said, okay, sir, let's, let's actually do a recap of all of this. You don't, you don't get invited back. I'll never be invited back to, to they'll never take me on a, on a tour, for example, of North Waziristan, right? Because they know that they can't lie to me. So that's, I know that was really, but is that, was that too mean? <laughs> uh, I want to just ask you. I just want a clarification actually. Don't you think, like, I mean, I appreciate uh, the clarification that you meant, uh, made, but don't you think some of the stuff that you've written, even your data, can be misused uh, by Hindu right-wingers in India to continue spewing hatred against Pakistanis and Muslims? That well, may not be your intention, but it can always be used that way. Well, look, facts are facts, right? So facts like a kaleidoscope. You give them a flick and you get one picture, you flick it again, you get a different picture. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm an atheist. I don't like communal politics of any stripe at all. So unfortunately, where India is domestically, it plays into Pakistan's worst fears. This is just a fact. Um, but you are where you are with that. Um, just because Pakistanis have views, my, my, I have, there is no morality in, in being truthful and presenting data. If someone uses it selectively, that's their problem, it's not mine. But my job is to, to do as best as I can to expose what Pakistanis think, right? My biggest problem is not that people misuse facts, is that they simply ignore them. Like for example, there's a myth that terrorists are poor and uneducated, and therefore if we bring people out of poverty and we educate people, terrorism goes away. Survey after survey that I've done in Pakistan shows that the poor people are the least likely to support these terrorist groups. It's just, it's just a lie. So this whole narrative of development that we've tied to counterinsurgency is a lie. So my real concern is not that they misuse facts, but they simply ignore them because they're inconvenient. So if they were to misuse the facts, I think that would actually be an improvement over simply ignoring them. Doctor, uh, yeah, my name is Bhagwan Edwani. Uh, doctor, I, I, I think you've done excellent work and I agree with most of, all of it, most of it, but can I take you back to 1948? Mm -hmm. uh, against the background of the Can you speak a little bit closer, because I have a really yeah, bad ear. Against the background of the fact that in Islamic history, warriors have always held a cult status. Mm -hmm. And so if uh, Pakistan is also Islamic, their warrior in quotes, which is now the army, would have some kind of cult status to begin with. And in 1948, they went into Kashmir. Bulk of them were regulars in Shalwar Kameez. And uh, they took half of Kashmir, maybe 40%, but they took territory-wise half of Kashmir. Uh, so therefore, I want you to see if in your studies that you had, did you come across any contrary opinion which talked about Nehru's, Nehru's effect in entrenching the army in Pakistan? Because the story goes, in 1948, after they were driven it to the current line of control, General Chaudhary, who later became chief of staff, mm -hmm. rang him up in Simla. And he says, I can go drive them completely to the border. And he said, no. As the story goes, this is the factual part of it, mm -hmm. but as the story goes, I don't know how true it is, he happened to be in the company of uh, Edwina Mountbatten, mm -hmm. and Edwina Mountbatten said, well, Dicky will not like it. And so he told General Chaudhary, you stop where you are, and we'll take action. The result was, 
that the Pakistani army at that time was roughly 150,000 people. Right. And the Indian army was, I think, 550 or 600,000, one to five. Right. And that is how in Pakistan for a long time, a story came that one Pakistani soldier is equal to 10. Hindustani, Hindus, not Hindustani, but Hindus. Yeah. And that only got reduced in 1965 and further reduced in 1971. So I think in some respect, we should give, uh, where we give Pandit Nehru a lot of credit for democracy in uh, India, we should give him equal credit for uh, entrenching the Pakistani army. And the other thing which you pointed out, they have done first class work in civilian work. When you have uh, uh, floods and etc. as the Indian army, the civilians have failed time after time, time after time. So they have got the cult status and uh, it's difficult how they hold the so I, so this, this uh, the, the, the Orbat, the order of battle thing, it's not just the 47-48 war. So what do you, if, if, you're the, if you're the publisher of the Pakistan Army Journal and you don't publish accounts of your own wars, because they don't, um, what do you publish? You publish accounts of Quranic battles. And so it's not just the, this thing, there's, you know, one, one Muslim is worth five Hindus. It's actually worse than that. Because they go and they look at Quranic battles, and these are, you can't make this up. Um, they'll say the number of Momin and the number of Kufar. And then they'll do the Momin to Kufar ratio. In the Battle of Badr, I think it was like one to 10,000. I mean, I mean, and then the outcome was, of course, the Momin won. And so when they rely upon these Quranic battles, they're doing two things. They are furthering this narrative that it doesn't matter how many Kufar there are, a dedicated Momin that fights for his faith can defeat these Kufar. Now, so this is, if you think about this logically, it has a motivational feature, right? How do you continue to mobilize Jawans and officers to continue to fight an, an enemy that's becoming stronger, right? Just by virtue of even, even, no matter what you said about Congress, it still had positive economic growth at a time when much of the world was in recession. So maybe he didn't make you happy, but you still had growth. So in that period, even if even though you kept your percent of GDP in, in terms of military spending well below 3%, you were still doing that, right? What, what did Pakistan have to do? It had to rely upon infusions from us and Saudi Arabia. So how do you continue to mobilize, or how do you continue to, um, so I'm looking for, um, ru uh, avza, right? My, English is my damn mother tongue and I'm forgetting the word. Uh, Hosla Avzai, was, help me out, Hosla, encourage, <laughs> sorry, it's jet lag, plus reading all these. So it's used to sort of encourage and inspire people who are always going to face an army, India, that's bigger than theirs, right? The other thing that it does is that this is kind of where Pakistan competes with Saudi Arabia. Pakistan wants to be the Islamic army, right? And so by constantly pitting its history in this concept of Islamic war fighting, they're saying that we are an Islamic army. And again, this is completely sensible, right, with their two-nation theory. What's the problem with that? Is that this clashes with the real debates in Islam, which is in Pakistan, which is about sectarianism. So the army wants to talk about there's one Islam. So the army never gets into the business of which Muslim it is. But on the ground in Pakistan, this is a very real bloody war. And so as long as Pakistan wants to keep promoting itself as an Islamic state, its allies that do all of the dirty work are saying which Islamic state it is. And so you have this constant tension between we are all the same, we're all Muslims at this level, but on the ground they're actually killing each over killing each other over we're all Muslim but but whose Islam is correct. And and so this is an equilibrium that's very, very bloody. And I don't know how Pakistan continues to sustain this ideology of we're an Islamic country and we're an Islamic army when you don't have a unified, uh, you know, there, there is at least five main traditions. So it's very difficult for them to keep this in balance in a way that doesn't cause serious bloodshed in Pakistan. And, and there's something like 40,000 people have been killed in the last 10 years, right? And that's, they're not being killed by you, they're not being killed by us, they're being killed by, by Muslims. So the consequences of this are real and they're for you, but I would argue they affect Pakistanis even more acutely. Anyway. Uh, I would like to know that already drawdown is declared 
in the USA, in Afghanistan. <clears throat> now, how do you visualize the future of this, this Afghan war? What would be the, because there's a recently, even the North Waziristan was attacked by military. Even Haqqani group was not spared. Which what is Haqqani group. Haqqani yeah, network. No, Haqqani network is being treated as a very much ally of Pakistan. All right, ISI. I know where you're going with this question. Where is the leadership of the Haqqani network? They ain't in Waziristan. They're in Islamabad. Why? Because they have to meet with the ISI, right? So who is in Waziristan? This is Operation Bukvas, okay? I want this to be very clear about what this operation is. They did this in 2010 in South Waziristan. So they've been publicizing this operation for five months. So any terrorist worth killing has already left. And where, has the, where have these individuals gone? They've gone to Afghanistan. More importantly, the Haqqani network, which was never, they said they were gonna target nonsense. They're, they're in Islamabad. The only Haqqani guy that's been killed was actually killed in what was probably a family feud on a motorcycle in Islamabad. Um, Gul Bahadur was a pro-Pakistan militant who says, if, if you invade North Waziristan, our peace truce is off. Well, where is Gul Bahadur now? If I had to make my guess, he's in Afghanistan. So the timing of this operation and the timing of the ceasefire that preceded it completely corresponded with a disrupting Afghan domestic politics. Madam, you, do you don't think that, is, that notion of strategic depth has been boomerang in Pakistan? You said something. It like is, it. There, that concept of strategic depth is going nowhere. So the Pakistanis, much like the British, who had concepts of, of a forward policy, which was one of active intervention in Afghanistan versus a closed policy, which is where they protected their frontier and relied more on proxies, the Pakistanis have their own version of this. So um, strategic depth is going nowhere. I don't, I don't care what Kiani said or what Sharif says. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's, it's a part of their strategic culture. If that were the case, if, if strategic depth were not a real issue, they would have no problem with Abdullah Abdullah being president. Right? But why, why do they not want Abdullah Abdullah to be president? Because they look at Abdullah Abdullah and what do they see? They see raw. Right? So this idea of strategic depth, it's going nowhere. It's there. It animates what they do. And so the, the Pakistanis were so angry that the Afghan Taliban couldn't disrupt the elections, they actually replaced the, uh, the uh, they're essentially their equivalent of a DGMO. So that, the timing of this, the timing of this operation, this is all about uh, completely interfering in Afghan domestic politics. It has nothing to do with them taking terrorism seriously. Let's take some more questions from others, please. We're a little short on time. But you're a peacenik, aren't you? You take, you take this seriously. Really? Yes, I think so. All right. Bad may hum is for behas kar sakte hain. Shirad Pikar. I have two questions. The first, yeah, my name is uh, Vihan Pandey and I'm a freelance IT consultant. Uh, I have two questions. The first is, is there any open source data on Jawan recruitment? Because your slide, nothing at all? Okay. Nothing. Or is, do you have a sense of how big is the disconnect in terms of uh, recruitment from districts and provinces of Javans to officers, is it? We, no? have, we have no data on Javans. No data at all. So these data were accidental. So basically, Shuja Nawaz, Asaf Nawaz's brother, when he was doing his book in the Pakistan Army, he walked in to the GHQ and said, I'd like Army data. And they said, oh, yes, sir, because you are Asaf Nawaz's brother. And um, Shuja and I were talking, and Shuja isn't a data man. Um, and so I said, listen, I can, I can do a lot of crazy stuff with these data because I have a lot of data nerds. And so I got these, I basically bought these data from Shuja. Um, and I don't think after his book they will ever give him more data. And they certainly won't give me data. Um, even though this actually tells a good news story for the Pakistan army. I mean, the, the, the fact that they've tried to do this and they're succeeding is a backhanded good news story for them. Yeah, in fact, uh, it segues to the next question, which was you said that... Uh, the hope is that the non, or rather the Punjabis outside the Punjab and the non-Punjabis who don't share the same kind of prejudices which eventually translate into those feelings which lead to terrorism right. one way or another. Now, you also mentioned that the younger generation, which is what the majority of Pakistan is, is more radical than their parents. So do you see that hope kind of failing or do you still see, you know, that there is a chance it might succeed? So, I mean... So how old are you? 
You're 32. So I'm 45, right? So when I was 19, I was out in demonstrations, uh, you know, when the Christians would go shoot doctors, I was at the clinic saying, what kind of Christian are you? You're a fascist, you're a freak, you know, blah, blah. I'm 45, I don't do that anymore, right? So, um, I mean, we all, we've all experienced this. So I think that this bubble of, as they say, the youth is, um, I'm already, I'm in contact with, you know, on Facebook, I have all these, these youth is that I hang out with. Um, they're very disappointed in Imran Khan. I, and actually what's been, what's really exposed him has been the Waziristan operation. Because if you live in Pakistan, you know this is nonsense. And Pakistanis are not fooled by this. They say they are killing no terrorists. And they, and a, a fabulous exchange with, with a very stalwart Imran Khan supporter in the past. He says, how can the army say they've killed 319 terrorists and 17 soldiers have died? How do they know from these air campaigns that they've killed 319? And I said, I'm very glad you raised this because you had absolutely no doubt when Code Pink said drones killed 3,492, right? <laughs> you can't have it both ways. And so we had this really interesting IM exchange. He says, you know, that's actually a really good point. I never thought about it that way. And, and then he said, so why is Imran Khan not getting so upset that basically they're not killing terrorists, they're displacing millions of Pashtuns. And he actually said, basically the army is trafficking in, in Pashtun misery so that it can look as if it's being effective. Now, by the way, going to the peacenik back there, um, you should note Senator Levin's uh, amendment to the, uh, uh, to our, the piece of legislation that authorizes our defense interactions. Senator Levin put a writer in that said, unless the Pakistanis conduct a North Waziristan operation, they will not release 300 million. So, you know, when you ask about the timing of it, it comes to, I think, money, the Afghan election, and then, of course, the airport attack. So if, if anyone thinks that this Waziristan operation means anything, I, I hate to be the, the cynic. Because <laughs> I assure you, the Haqqanis are lounging around in the Serena. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Hi, my name is Rishi. I'm with ORF, and I was one of, on one of these trips, the track to, to Karachi and uh, Lahore, just six months back. And Lums was one of the sponsors. And I found it very fascinating when you said that uh, the youth are turning out to be more menacing. I didn't say menacing. Yeah. I said tongue nuzzle. Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Rad no, tongue nuzzle doesn't mean radical. It's just narrow minded, right? Tongue nuzzle, narrow minded. In huh. other words, less accepting of inclusiveness. Okay. More less. narrow minded, I think. More narrow minded. Right yeah. So, and then I'm combining it with something else where you said that uh, the poor are not getting drawn to radicalism or becoming jihadis. Which means, uh, I'm just trying to figure out, do you think one of the average LUMS graduate fits into that category? So, you may have, so did you I'm, notice, um, so are you, Indian, some of you guys get really, are early, early risers. I would get up very, when I taught at LUMS, I, I'm a runner, and I, you don't want to run anytime after nine, because then the students see you running. As a professor, you never want to have you see your student exercise. That, that just ruins the whole teacher-student bond when they see you sweating like a pig and running shorts. So, either, so I would get up at like five o'clock. As soon as the sun was up, I would get up because I would run for an hour and a half or two hours. Um, so the, the students that were on lungs that would go to that, to that first prayer, many of them, and many of them would actually be in my class. And so I, I noticed, because my hostel was, not, was up the street from the mosque. And so we began striking up a conversation. Um, if you were to talk to some of the faculty member at LUMS, they're very worried about the, the imam of that mosque. Um, the other thing I noticed, and um, so in India, like a lot of men will have their trousers raised high so they, they, their garzi is really bad. <laughs> but in Pakistan, that's actually a serious thing. So you'll see men with suits, and they'll have their, their trousers uh, hiked up. And that means something. And so I was really struck when I was, in the, and actually that's a very clever way of, of combining, you know, Ali Hadith's ideology with the compulsion of having to wear modern clothing. So Americans will typically focus upon hijab, niqab, but I was focusing upon men's attire because women's attire is, could mean family issues. It can mean, for example, the girls that were always the naughtiest were these girls. <laughs> Because their fathers would say, oh, my baby, you know, she is such a Sharif Muslim. And she had nothing about that girl was Sharif. <laughs> so um, a lot of the girls would wear uh, hijab, niqab, is like social camouflage. The ones, so 
So I thought it was much more interesting to pay attention to how the men were dressing. So the next time you go back to Lums, keep an eye out for the, Jew, the dudes with well, the suits. I was also doing that, and that's yeah. where that question came up. Exactly. And the second thing is uh, the influence of Saudi Arabia. I met some of Kashmiris. In Bingo. fact, big. So they were absolutely yeah. pissed off. They said these Wahhabis are destroying uh, the whole cultural this thing mix. Yeah. In fact, I met some people who were really envious of India. They said your multiculturalism really saves you. Mm -hmm. And they were fed up of being this Islamic kind of a state. So I think where do you see these people being able to or they will never influence the matters in Pakistan at all? So, so Lanz is a really interesting place, right? So. When I think about, for a person to really understand global, oh. Oh, sorry, the Lahore University of Management Science. It's like the MIT of Pakistan. It's not MIT, but it's the MIT of Pakistan. So, um, and I don't mean that condescendingly. I mean, it's, it's the best that you're going to get. And it's not just for elite students. They actually have a very good program of training youngsters to prepare them for LUMS, and they have scholarship programs. So LUMS is a very interesting place where, so some people talk about Pakistan's becoming, becoming urbanized. I actually think of the cities becoming ruralized, right? Because the Pandus are coming into the cities. And so a place like LUMS is a really interesting example of that, because the people that I found were much more likely to support Osama bin Laden, for example, were the cosmopolitans, because they understood Osama bin Laden's message, they also believed him to be real, right? If you're a Pandu, you, what is this Osama bin Laden? He's the Easter Bunny, right? You have no real experience that he's real. So in a place like Lums, where you have these genuine cosmopolitans with what I would call sort of like traditional Pandus, it's a really interesting mix. So I would meet, now in my class, of course, truly anti-Americans would never take my class. Right? But I knew friends of my students who would never take my class because I'm, a, I'm an American. Um, so you have to, again, just constantly be aware of who you're meeting at LUMS. Because at LUMS, you're going to meet some of the most socially progressive people. And the people that are socially regressive are going to stay away from you if they figure out that you're from India. In my case, I can't hide the fact that, you know, I can wear a shower kameez, but I still look like I'm a honky. So, um, and then listening. I mean, I, I, I loved going to the cafeteria and just listening to what students were saying. But, so LUMS is an interesting critter. I was supposed to teach at Foreman Christian College, um, which is, again, a very different class of student, but the ISI had uh, issues with me. So. Business to business relationships are generally considered to be the uh, icebreakers and you know improve ties in the future. And with the civilian government in Pakistan coming up with the most favored nation concept, and the, even the Pakistani military having a significant stake in the businesses there, you think that you know the business to business ties will improve Indo-Pak relations in the future and maybe reduce the slight opposition that the Pakistani army has to India, or do you think it won't have any significant effect? So who's killed the NDMA? Who's killed it? The Pak Army killed it. And they, they killed it because they felt that this was too dissociated from what they loved, the composite dialogue. Why did you guys give them the composite dialogue? <laughs> you should just take that right back. So the Pak Army, so in this book, I didn't talk about it here, but I argue that Pakistan's army is an ideological army. It's not a security-seeking army. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So some years ago, I wrote a piece. I think Indians misunderstood the argument because they didn't read the argument. They read the first paragraph, and they said, oh, what the hell's wrong with this woman? I said, listen, let's, give, let's put on the table for Pakistan a, a, a completely uh, conditions-based civilian nuclear deal, right? The conditions that were in Kerry Luger Berman, let's put it. You meet these conditionalities, we'll give you a civilian nuclear deal, right? If they were a security-seeking state, they should have taken that deal, right? But they aren't a security-seeking state. They're an ideological state, right? This means that when the army thinks about what's in its corporate interests, they're not thinking with the same cost-benefit calculus that you're thinking. So what does the army want? So here's the Army's game plan in Pakistan. It's sort, of, it's sort of like a virus, right? It dies if the host dies. 
but it wants to extract maximum benefit from the host, right? And the way the Pakistan Army can do this, because it just basically sets the budget, the Pakistan Army has no want. It gets whatever it wants. It relies upon the international community to basically keep the rest of the country on life support because of this notion of that we're too dangerous to fail, right? So, that, so what the Pakistan Army is always trying to do is basically be a parasite on the state, but not kill the state. And, and in fact, it has an incentive to keep the, 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 the state alive by creating the very arguments that make the international community to pay the place. Right? This is, I argue, uh, this is essentially the Pakistan Army's strategy. So when it comes to economic normalization, they will have no problem with certain kinds of economic ties. But where they will stop it is when they think that this has the potential to do something else, like create a genuine uh, lobby for normalization in Pakistan. So what they're going to try to do is calibrate those gains. But you should make, you have no illusions. The Pakistan army gets what it wants. It doesn't need trade with you <laughs> to get what it wants because it extorts the international community, right? So um, don't, I, don't get all crazy about Nawaz Sharif. And, and by the way, what happened in 1999? Right, Cargill, um, and if you're paying attention to, the, to some of the weird stuff that's happening episodically in Kashmir now, not so much now, but a number of months ago, it was almost like a slow motion Cargill. And Sharif isn't stupid. Sharif has seen this movie before and ended up with him, you know, living in Saudi Arabia, barely escaping a noose. So he's not going to be. And, he, and by the way, the other interesting thing, much, Nawaz Sharif, I'm going to give him credit. He's learned some very interesting lessons. So he's not putting his political capital on the NDMA. He's not doing that. Where he put his political capital was on the Musharraf trial. And I have to commend him for this, because even if Musharraf escapes prosecution, the next army chief that even thinks about this is going to have to think about this really hard. Because how did Musharraf leave? He resigned under threat of impeachment. That was path-breaking. And, and no army chief had ever been tried for treason. So in some strange way, Nawaz Sharif has put his political capital where he should put it if he's actually thinking about long-term civilian control over the military. So from my point of view, I, I, I'm actually surprised at the, the almost forethought <laughs> that went into it. And I actually don't think that's an accident because Nawaz Sharif could have brought that government down at any point, right, if he had been willing to play games with the military. They would have been happy. There were several times when the PPP government was about to fall. And he actually showed considerable um, restraint, understanding that it's best to let that PPP government serve its term and then be voted out. My question is, did Zardari learn the same lesson? Right? Would Zardari, and, and it always will happen, right? He's going to disappoint. They always do. Will Zardari exploit the fissures between the court and the military and, and then the inevitable disappointment to bring down the government. I'm not so sure that Zardari's learned his lesson, but I think Nawaz did. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, my name is Jia, and I'm a sophomore at Middlebury. Um, and I can't claim to know as much as a lot of the other people in this room, but, um, and I have a lot of questions for you. But I'm focusing sort of on, I've been reading a lot about anti-Pakistan um, militant groups within Pakistan that are even fighting the army. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little more about that, please? Yeah, so I'm very, we have to be very careful when we talk about anti-Pakistan militant groups because Pakistan loves that language. Nothing makes them more happy to say, how can we support terrorism? We're a victim of the same terror. Um, they love to exploit the confusion over Lashkar Jangvi and Lashkar Taiba. They love it, love it, love it. I have scholars who are my colleagues who think Lashkar Jangvi is Lashkar Taiba, right? Um, so let's talk about the TTP. They are a Deobandi organization. Right? So they come from the same madrasas and mosques as the Afghan Taliban, Jaish al-Muhammad, Harkat al-Jihad Islami, Lashkar Jangvi, and SSP. You, I would argue that there would be no TTP had none of those groups existed. Right? So where Pakistan finds itself is that when it began working with the Americans, Part of those Deobundi groups didn't understand the big strategic picture that Pakistan was continuing to support the Taliban. They only saw the optic that Pakistan helped bring down the only Deobundi government, right? 
And they began turning against the state as early as, I, well, the first evidence of it was when Jaisha Muhammad split in around December 2001, Jamaat al Farqan went off to target the state, and Masood Azhar stayed loyal. So that's when this begins. And then you have all these other interactions that layer in, like when the Pakistan army went into South Waziristan. Um, then you had the U.S. putting pressure on groups like uh, Jaish e Muhammad, Lashkar e Taiba, to not go into India. And so basically they went into Fatah to be pushed over into operations in Afghanistan. Lashkar e Taiba has been killing my troops in Afghanistan since 2004. And so as these different militant groups that shared ideology began co-locating, some of them, and so this is Pakistan's fundamental problem, some of those groups co-located in Fatah are their assets. Some of them would very much like to destroy the Pakistani state. But when the Pakistan army thinks about dealing with them, they would never want to kill someone that they could turn in the future. Right? And this is very different from, say, Saudi Arabia. When Saudi Arabia wants to kill a terrorist, they're going to kill a terrorist because Saudi's proxies are not Saudi. This is Pakistan's problem. Their proxies are Pakistani. So um, only after commanders show that they are absolutely unwilling to play ball do they give the Americans the drone coordinates and they find themselves you know, a pile of ashes. This was true of Naik Mohammed. It was true of uh, Haki Mullah, and the list goes on. By the way, you know, most of the people we're killing with drones are Pakistani terrorists, not our terrorists, uh, not something that people really want to acknowledge. So yeah, Pakistan's experiencing blowback but it's blowback that derived from their own policies. Now, it's true that they probably would not have been experiencing this blowback had the, the war on terror not happened, had they not been forced to work with us in Afghanistan, but it's also true that there would be no TTP had there been none of these Dale Bundy militant groups that the ISI made to begin with. So when I talk about this, and when you write about it, I think it's important that we emphasize that this is blowback, right? If you go to Pakistan, and they talk about the shrines being blown up, they believe it's a raw agent. Um, you'll hear right after the airport attack, these boys that were not circumcised, right? What, what, what does that mean? They're trying to say these are Indian agents. Um, it turns out, you know, by the way, Masoods and many Central Asians don't circumcise. So it may be that the, and by the way, I, how did they check the, you know, the apparatus of, <laughs> of a suicide bomber? Um, that's the raw, apparently ISI has like a, you know, a, uh, circumcision inspection unit on suicide bombers. I just, I mean, I, I just, how do you, I, I couldn't help but laugh when I heard this. And these boys, they were not as circumcised. Like, really? How did you know that? So uh, it's important that we call the Bukhavas flag on their own narrative. And, and by the way, until Pakistanis accept that these are Pakistanis killing Pakistanis because of blowback, there'll never be any domestic change. There would never be any domestic pressure for them to stop supporting these groups. Just time for two more questions. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. My name is Druti. And uh, I would like to ask, in what, in the terms that TV Paul actually states, he, he says Pakistan is a garrison state. And with that having been said, and in a couple of your papers also, you point out to the fact that the weak civil society and now putting that together with the current political drama that has been going on, um, at the level of Imran Khan having charged um, um, charged PMLN with the fact that with the poll rigging, uh, Qadri coming into Pakistan and the whole drama. What, seem, what is likely now the scene of democracy in Pakistan, if I can call it so? And in such a case, can, is there ever going to be a possibility of like a complete democracy? whereby they can actually place development projects within their own country. Because that is one thing that seems completely lacking, even in case of IDPs that you find from North Waziristan today, because they are the ones that have been most affected. So, so I mean, look, in this, in this case, I don't think Pakistan politics is so much more different from Indian politics, in the sense that it's patronage, right? So most people get elected not because they want to come up with good policies. Right? They mostly want to have access to patronage funds that they can then dole out in various ways that are advantageous to their patronage networks and, of course, to themselves. So if there's going to be a development project, there's always going to be a cut right, made to the various alliance of chumchas. So Pakistan 
is probably even worse than India in some sense because there were no land reforms in the way that India had land reforms. And the other issue that I think Pakistan is worse than India is that Indian politics is you have national parties, right? And that was in fact beginning with the Indian National Congress is that when independence happened, it was a grassroots party. The Pakistan, what became the Muslim League, all of their political constituencies were here, right? So this would be like, I, when I teach this in the US, this would be like a bunch of members of the Democratic Party go up to Canada and they try to reconstitute themselves as politicians. It's very difficult for them to do. So you, you never, you really didn't see the development of mass politics based in Pakistan until Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, right? And then, even then, it wasn't national politics. It was still very regionally associated. So the problem that Pakistan has dealing with this question is that it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, and you've seen the card, I'm not going to give you the cartoon of the chicken and the egg, but nonetheless, um, for Pakistan to have a responsive democracy, they need to have tax reform. Right? All, all fun, even, so Pakistan has the worst tax collection record of any state in South Asia. Um, Bangladesh is better at tax collection than Pakistan is. And so taxes have a force function, because like when you are forced to pay taxes to your local government and to your federal government, you demand services. And if you don't get services for your money that you're forced to pay, you elect the, the woman or the person out. This is so important that Pakistan have this. This will never happen because of basically the feudal capture and the industrial elite capture that sits in the parliament. If they themselves are not elites, the people that elect them are. And so I'm not optimistic that, now, the other thing is, the reason why they don't ever have to do this, they've never had a moment like India had in 1990 where you were completely broke, right? And why will Pakistan never have that moment is because of the IMF, right? So I say to my, to, and this is why the State Department thinks I'm crazy, I, you have to, so basically this is methadone treatment, right? We're treating the drug addict with methadone, right? We're not treating the substance abuse. We're simply letting them be addicted but to something that we think is controllable and manageable. The only Pakistan will ever fix itself is if it is completely allowed to sink or swim on the merits of its own policies. And I actually, I'm not anti-Pakistan. I believe that Pakistan will do the right thing for itself when it has to. But right now, it would be astrategic to do anything other than what they're doing, because right now, they're getting to do what they want, and the IMF bails them out, right? So the best thing that I think the Americans can do is to basically unplug the methadone. But they're not going to do it. I'm, I tell you bluntly, they're, they're not going to do it. Well, so this is what TV Paul gets wrong, right? He acts as if the Americans made that geostrategic curse because he didn't read the basic early history of U.S.-Pakistan relations. The Pakistanis cultivated that strategic curse. He, he may be saying this now, but he doesn't write it. If you read his book, that's not what he writes. Yes, so uh, I like him, and I was asked to review the book, and I'm like, I'm not going to review it because he'll just get mad. Because he talks about how the Americans lured Pakistan into our strategic designs, and that's just not how it happened. We didn't care about Pakistan until the Korean War. So from 47, the Pakistanis were saying, you can have our army, seriously, you can have our army. And we're like, we don't really want your army. <laughs> um, they begged and pleaded to be led into CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. We're like, if we let you in, then actual Southeast Asian countries won't come in. Um, so the whole history of, uh, the early history was of the Pakistanis basically, you know, being a dullah, <laughs> pimping out their army. <laughs> so that's a really important distinction that TV Paul gets wrong, because he basically blames the Americans for making this geostrategic curse. And what actually happened, and by the way, this is true of every point in history. So the jihad policy, Pakistanis say that this was our jihad policy. Actually, Zulfiqar set up the jihad cell in 74. So the primary Mujahideen groups were already formed before the Soviets even crossed the Amudarya. Musharraf basically used 9-11 to get support for what he was doing anyway. It's not the case that we use our strategic interests to give Pakistan money to do our bidding. They actually used us to get our money to do their bidding.
So I, it's a subtle distinction. I, dis I don't disagree with his main thesis, but the origins of it was Pakistan's designs. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Can we just have one last question here, we and then later. we'll end the... Hi. Uh, as U.S. Army is currently in Afghanistan, and uh, can India and uh, uh, U.S. Uh, walk into something like we can uh, wipe out the terrorism in Pakistan because uh, because the U.S. Army is currently in Afghanistan. So uh, that is one of my question. Other question is, uh, what's the possibility of India-Pakistan uh, nuclear war? And uh, you know, uh, and thirdly, uh, as Pakistan was created from India, so uh, if we go back to past to the history, uh, could India do more? Uh, like to avoid the creation of Pakistan. To do more to what? Uh, uh, India could have done better. Uh, like, uh, if you go back to the past, the history, uh, like we could have avoided the creation of Pakistan itself. No, like. you couldn't. You're deluding yourself if you think that. that. So take that off the table. And in any event, what's the point of thinking like this? Right? Pakistan, hey, it's there. And I don't, I don't think you could have gotten away with this because the Brits wanted to break out. And because the Congress completely abdicated from, they basically resigned from government, it, basically the Brits were left working with the Muslim League. So you'd have to do a whole, you have to unfold that decision tree pretty damn far back to get a different outcome. So no, there, I don't think, there, there, there's no point in thinking like this. But as to whether or not India can be aggressive about Pakistan, that's a really a question that you have to ask yourself. I tell Americans that when there's a terrorist attack in India, the Americans should simply not say anything, right? Let India sort this out. Because when the Americans sit on India, right, which is what we do, you know, right now we need the Pakistanis to be doing our alleged bidding, which seems to be mostly killing our troops in Afghanistan, we'll say, don't escalate, otherwise they'll move west to east. That's what we did in 2002. We were very worried about this in 2008. So my view is when we're no longer in Afghanistan and we're no longer dependent upon Pakistan, it should be India's responsibility. We should simply remove ourselves. It's you know it reminds me of when I was a, a kid. Um, I used to watch those Popeye cartoons, and you would see this and what you actually when the camera it's not a camera it's a cartoon. There's actually someone holding the fellow like this, right? So basically a lot of punching in the air, but he was never going forward because someone was holding him back. And so basically India could say whatever it wanted to say. The fact is the situation was overly constrained. So that's a question for you. I mean, uh, does India have the capability? I mean, I, I actually am kind of a hawk. I'm a fan of cold start, right? Take the advantage of limited war that you learn from Cargill. And, and, but you have issues with military and civilian relations here, which are you know very, very difficult and intractable. There's no CDS. Um, so you know your civil military relationship better than I do. But going to the issue of nuclear war, again, I'm a believer, if you're going to undermine Pakistan's ability to coerce, you have to be willing to call their bluff. Now, I don't, so if you look at how Pakistan has pursued, you know, what they'll call battlefield nuclear weapons, this is a coercive, this is a politically coercive tool. They're trying to coerce us so that we get involved in a conflict cycle earlier, right? Because these things are, we, we get freaked out when these things are out and forward deployed because they're easily stolen. We get freaked out when there's a conflict because the weapons are mated and, and mobilized for potential use. Again, more, more vulnerable to being stolen than, than when they are in their barracks. So this is about coercing us to intervene as it is about coercing you to do nothing. Right, so from my view, we need to pull ourselves out of the coercion loop. And I don't think, Pakistan's very rational. Let's just, let's just think this through. I always, when I was in Lums, I would start this. Okay, um, the Indians move across the Alka. What are you gonna do? We're gonna use our nuclear weapons. I said, okay, I want you to really think about that. Where are you seated right now? Where are you having lunch? Do you really want your army to use nuclear weapons when they come across the Alka? Are, are you really advocating this? Um, do you realize that you will probably be incinerated so even students, when they think through the decision tree, rapidly understand that their country won't survive a retaliatory strike, right? These are 18-year-olds. If 18-year-olds can work through this logical decision tree, and oh, by the way, where is the majority of the Pakistan Army's assets situated? In the Punjab, right? Surely the gentlemen, and they're all gentlemen at SPD, can go through those similar calculations. So this enables me to be a hawk. I'm actually ultimately very confident that Pakistan is very rational. 
and I don't believe they would do this. So in other words, I am, I am probably a larger, a more vocal proponent of something like cold start than any Indians are. <laughs> and I'm a Democrat. I'm not supposed to be a hawk, but whatever. Uh, I think that we'll end our questions now.